I take the bus every evening after work. Usually, the sun would have already disappeared among the jigsaw-like skyline of the big city by the time I do. It was a normal Wednesday afternoon, and I was sitting at the back of the bus as always. As I shifted my attention from looking through the window to the reflection of the inside of the bus compartment, I noticed a girl sitting with her back facing me, a few rows in front of me on the right. She had soft brown hair. Her complexion, revealed by the nape of her neck, was rather pale. But I wasn't sure, as it wasn't dark enough outside to have a clear view of her reflection. I tried not to be a creep by staring at her for too long, but something was rather odd about her that I could not put my finger on. I turned my head a little as I glanced in the direction of where she was supposed to be sitting. My stomach dropped. There was no one sitting there. Frantically, I glanced back at the reflection, mentally telling myself that it must have been a hallucination or something, that it was caused by the stress I had after working the entire day. No, she was still there, sitting three rows in front of me next to the window. I tried to ignore the image in the reflection throughout the entire trip back home. I didn't try to move or anything to get a better view of her. I was a bit afraid, I guess. While I was getting off the bus, I closed my eyes. I did not want to try to see her face. Maybe she was just a lost spirit and was trying to hitch a ride. The next few weeks after the sighting, things had been normal. I didn't see the girl in the reflection again. It just went along with all the other annoyances in my head, to the garbage can of my mind. I tried doing some research on the internet about a girl on a bus, but came up with nothing. The second time I saw her was another evening after work. This time the sky was a little brighter. This time she was sitting right in front of me. And this time I knew she was real. As usual, I sat in the back, and again, there were barely any passengers. I was on my phone when I noticed her. The reflection of her brown hair dangling was on my screen. That hair seemed to have appeared suddenly out of nowhere. Yet again, the seat was empty. No person was sitting there, as I had presumed. I glanced at the glass pane next to me and there she was, stiffly seated with her hands on her lap, facing forward. I was paralyzed with fear. I told myself that this was all not real, that I should get a therapist as soon as I have a chance, once the weekend comes. There was this faint odor of decay, like the smell of meat that's been out in the sun too long. I could almost see the profile of her face this time, and then the hair on my arms stood up, realizing why this girl or this thing creeped me out so much. She or it seemed to have no features on its head. I couldn't see the suggestion of any eyelashes, eyebrows, or a nose from my position. Her head seemed like a person's head that was covered up by many layers of balloons, like a thick layer of pale white skin the rest of the trip, I prayed to God that the thing wouldn't move or anything, and it didn't. There was no sign of life in it. Not even a single movement came from the thing that sat in front of me. It was as if it was a sick sculpture from another dimension, only seen through a mirror, just to scare the living daylights out of me. However, something inside me kept telling me that this thing was alive and it's aware of me. I fled from the bus as soon as I reached my stop. That should have been it. I should have avoided taking that damned bus. But no, after seeing a therapist who told me that all of this was in my head, a product of my desire and fear from my daily life, 
I continued taking the bus to work. It was a dark and cloudy morning, and it was raining heavily. I was sitting in the second to last row. The reflections were marked distinctly. As the darkness outside helped raise the contrast, I fell asleep while listening to my headphones, as I slept very little the night before. After I woke up, the bus seemed to have parked, but it was too dark outside, so I couldn't figure out where I was. I secretly cursed that I had overslept, and that the bus driver had left me in the middle of nowhere. Then it suddenly occurred to me that the lights inside the compartment were still on, even though the engine was already off. As I tried to assess my current situation, I pulled my phone out of my pocket to call for help. I noticed the thing in the reflection again. My arm froze midair. It was sitting right next to me. I slowly turned my head, hoping that it was just the phantom imprinted in the reflection. But no, this time it actually was sitting right next to me. The thing in the mirror had merged with reality. It's here to get me. Now I see her face. I see the gaping hole where its mouth should have been. It's like it was silently screaming this whole time. Fear overwhelmed me and I passed out in my seat. When I woke up again, it was gone. I stopped taking the bus. I was in eighth grade, and it happened on a Monday after school. I remember it was a Monday, because that was our formal dress day. It wasn't a Catholic school, but the uniform was exactly what you'd expect. A short plaid skirt, button-down shirt with a tie, knee-high socks, and black dress shoes. I was barely reaching the age where I realized how some older males would react to this uniform. Anyway, on this particular day, my friend's mom picked her and I up from school so we could hang out. Her mom had to go somewhere, so she dropped us off and left again. She lived in this swanky, gated community with lots of huge, expensive houses, and we liked to walk around the neighborhood and explore. Each home sat on an average of one acre, so it was a decent walk from one home to the next. We decide right as the sun is starting to set that we should go home. We were heading back to her house to play some video games, and were about two streets away when we realize a red van with at least two twenty-ish men was following us. This neighborhood is full of expensive homes and really rich people, so the beat-up van seemed weird. We quickly realized this car was intentionally keeping a close distance behind us and began to get scared. We started walking faster, and they must have noticed so they parked on the side of the road. The houses were so big and so far apart that by the time we noticed them getting out of the van and calling after us, we only had enough time to run to the house we were directly in front of. This house was for sale. It had been vacant for a while. There were lots of weeds and the grass was tall. We were legitimately freaking out at this point as what turns out to be four guys are at the end of the driveway, yelling at us to stop and how they just wanted to ask us something. Luckily they weren't running or they would have caught up to us. However, their creepy casual attitude about the whole situation is almost more unsettling. With nowhere to go, we run around the house to the backyard and luckily the gate was unlocked. The backyard is huge, and there's a large shed, with the equipment for the pool. Despite the size, there wasn't any other option for hiding other than that shed. My friend motioned over there. We were too afraid to speak, 
since the guys would surely hear us and make it back here any minute. But in a split second decision, I tried to open the back door. Holy shit, it's unlocked. The realtor must have left it unlocked in case people wanted to tour the house, but didn't figure anyone would break in. Again, nice neighborhood with a guard and a gate. We quickly go inside the house, lock the back door, and barely have time to get out of the view of the backyard. This house was massive and had huge windows along the living room and dining room with a big open view of the backyard. The place was probably a lot nicer when it was built, 80s maybe, but now it was just creepy. You know the style back then, everything had a mirrored surface and black and white tiles. We crawled through the living room and hid behind the extravagant mirrored wet bar. The bad thing is, actually it was probably good, but it was scary. We could see in the backyard with the mirrors. We are both silently crying at this point. I'll never forget what we saw. These four guys are looking for us very intently. Of course, the first place they go is the shed. We both start crying even more now, a mixture of fear and relief that we didn't hide in there. They didn't give up just yet, however. The guys knew we must be somewhere. We entered the backyard through the only gate. Our momentary relief is stolen as we see one guy walking towards the back door. We held our breath as we second guessed whether or not one of us locked it. As he pulled the handle and the door was locked, he seemed satisfied that we couldn't be in the house. Eventually they give up and leave but we were still scared. We hid there for what felt like forever, silently crying, shaking, and wincing at any noise. It was after dark when we finally got the courage to leave the house, and we ran all the way back to her place. Her mom was home by that time, and we told her what happened. Immediately they called the guard, who has license plate numbers of all the cars that enter. Apparently, this car was used by a maintenance crew for another home. I don't think anything came of it, because they technically didn't do anything wrong, and they never came back. That was the last time we explored that neighborhood. About two months ago, my friends and I went bar hopping to celebrate one of our close friends from high school, moving back east from California. Normally, Ryan was the life of the party and a heavy drinker. At 6'5", he was usually drinking my 5'6 ass under the table. He was even once a bouncer and bartender at one of the bars we visited. That night, however, was different. Ryan didn't drink any alcohol. He even prefaced the outing with, Hey guys, I know we are celebrating Jeremy's homecoming, but I've been trying to get healthy so I've quit drinking. If it helps, I'll drive anyone around and only charge 80% of what Uber charges. Ha! This struck me as odd. Far be it from me to stop a guy getting healthier but this was just so out of the ordinary for Ryan. We had always been close, so I approached him and asked if everything was all right. He looked at me and shook his head in a weak way. I'm just really tired, been going through a lot of shit lately, haven't been getting a lot of sleep, you know? I think my house is haunted. This last sentence he said with a bit of humor in his voice but a serious look in his eyes. I had not been to his newest house, so, naturally, I asked him to elaborate. He went on to explain that he keeps waking up in the night and seeing things in his room. First he said he felt like someone was watching him from the foot of his bed 
for several nights. Then he said he saw the outline of a figure in his room at the foot of his bed, and that he woke up screaming and shaking. He said it was so bad that it woke his girlfriend up. I told him that it sounds like he may be having night terrors or sleep paralysis. He laughed and told me I was probably right. A few weeks later, he messaged me, saying that his longtime live-in girlfriend had left him for another guy, and that she had been sleeping with someone on the side for over a year. The worst part was they were still living together, but sleeping in different rooms. Financially, neither one of them could move out immediately. He told me the figure was back in his room, all that week, standing at the foot of his bed. When I asked him to describe what he saw, he told me that he couldn't make out any real features in the dark, but he could swear it was smiling at him, possibly even laughing. I told him I would work things out with my wife to sleep over at his place sometime soon. Earlier last week, he called me up and said the visions were getting worse and he was afraid to close his eyes. His voice sounded strained, like he hadn't slept in days. He told me the figure was back and even closer to his bed this time. I asked him if anything else had changed, and he said the figure was giving a low chuckle and was holding something that looked like a head. He said once he was able to force himself awake, he grabbed his blanket and went out into the living room. I went by his house last night. He was sitting on the couch wrapped in a blanket, staring at the TV, which was off. His eyes looked heavy. He smelled awful and his face was covered in a thick scruff. I asked how he was doing and he only shrugged eyes still fixed on the TV. I sat next to him and patted his shoulder. I told him he shouldn't be embarrassed about this, and that stress can bring on all sorts of ailments and abnormalities. I asked if his ex was there. Again, only a shrug. Finally, I looked toward what I assumed was his room, and asked if he was going to try and sleep. He slowly turned his head to me and said, No, I don't go in there anymore. I told him no worries and hung out with him until sleep got the better of him. After he was asleep, I walked over to his room and opened the door. What I saw haunts me even as I type these words. The floor, parts of the walls, and sheets were stained with dry blood. The body of his ex and the body of who I assumed was her lover were propped into sitting positions in opposite corners facing the bed, her head placed in his lap and vice versa. As horrible as the scene was, the one detail that made my stomach twist into a knot that has yet to come undone is that at the foot of Ryan's bed was a wide full-length mirror. I'll never forget that night. It was last year. I had just turned 25. I had been to a friend's wedding in another state and was returning by train. I reached the station around 5 a.m., it was freezing as the temperature had hit 4 degrees. All I could think of was getting home fast so I could sleep for hours after being tired from so many nights. I generally avoided traveling alone in the dark, but it was impossible to wait at the station until sunrise because one hour seemed like a very long time, so I decided to get a taxi. The distance from the station to my apartment is roughly 25 miles. There were two taxis and I got into one of them without making any eye contact with the driver. 
I told him where I wanted to go and we started. This man must have been in his late fifties or early sixties. He had silver gray hair and a big build. I decided to go with this taxi because I thought I'd be more safe with this fellow since he was elderly. It was a mistake. About 15 minutes had passed. I was looking at the road ahead. There were very few cars and all I could see were the trees that were close by and fog covering everything else. Suddenly I noticed that this guy had been staring at me from the rear view mirror and he didn't blink or look away when I looked at him. It had been over two minutes and he was still staring. He had scary droopy eyes. I was very uncomfortable at this point, so I used my scarf to cover half of my face, which was only covering my neck all this time. This didn't stop him and he suddenly started laughing like a maniac. Then he said a word in some other language, I believe, so I asked him to repeat it. My heart was beating very fast. So many people are dying, he said and he started laughing again. I was too afraid to ask him any more questions. I was frozen, regretting that I didn't wait at the station. My hands were shivering because I was trying to send a message to a friend, but my fingers just couldn't type properly. He turned his head to face me. He asked me if I was married. I managed to speak nervously. No. And he said, You will repent. With these words, he started to speed up. My mind was going crazy now. What the fuck did he mean by that? Why would he say such a thing to me? I looked around, trying to decide if it would be a good idea to just jump out of the taxi. But it was still very dark, and there weren't many cars around. By this point, I was pretty convinced that he was taking me to some other place. Maybe he wasn't, but I was too terrified to think straight. I was trembling with fear, and I was sure he was going to attack me or do something worse. Suddenly, he slowed down, and he seemed to be talking to himself. People die. You'll die. She'll die. Pointing to the empty seat. With those words, he stopped the taxi right there and asked me to get out, saying, We need fresh air and we're out of gas. He wasn't drunk, but he had been hallucinating since he kept blabbering, looking at the empty seat and was laughing for no reason. Arguing with him could make him annoyed, so I decided to do as he said. I got out, and this guy got out too. Now he was in front of me, but at a car's length distance, holding a flashlight, pointing it on his neck, and repeating, You will repent. I was almost crying due to fear, but running probably wasn't a great idea. I could be hit by a car due to the fog, and my mind was not working properly. It felt like a scene from a horror movie, and his eyes appeared bigger than normal due to the flashlight. He said something again that I didn't understand. I was sure he was going to kill me or torment me. I was extremely restless and looking around for help. To my relief, there was a car passing by and it stopped there looking at us just standing in the middle of the road. The guy came running to me and asked me to go towards his car where his daughter, who was nearly my age, opened the door. The insane cab driver ran back to his taxi and drove off in seconds. Clearly, there was plenty of gas. I was still breathing heavily and told them what had happened in the last 30 minutes. They told me I was in the opposite direction and it was not a safe area since many incidents with girls had happened there already. I was right. That driver was taking me to some other place. They had sensed something was wrong by the way that maniac stood there holding the flashlight. Had they not stopped, 
I might not be alive to write down this incident. Since then, I never travel alone at night. Never ever. I am thankful to those people who saved my life. Sometimes we see many people who say they need help, but we fear it could be a trap and we don't stop. Had they thought the same, I might be dead. Hey guys and ladies, thanks for watching. Submit a true story or a creepypasta by emailing me at the address in the description. We have our very first advertisement, so let's check it out. Are you tired of hearing your friends or family's disgusting flatulence? Yes! Does the noise of someone busting ass really get on your nerves? Yeah! <coughs> yeah! Does the sound of somebody blasting out a shit ghost really piss you off? Yes! 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 Well, not anymore. Introducing the Toot Flute from Ripco. Ripco. The Toot Flute is a major breakthrough in fart technology, and it's so easy to use. Step one, insert the Toot Flute into your ass. Ooh. Step two, fart. It's that simple. There are various versions of the toot flute that you can order. The boat horn. The trumpet. The kazoo. The silly whistle for kids. and the original flute. Ah. Practice and master your instrument. He's good. Get good and jam with your buddies. Man, it smells like a sewer in here. What are you guys doing? We're jamming, bro. The Toot Flute can be yours for three easy payments of $22.20. Order now while supplies last. Once again, that's the Toot Flute from Ripco. Ripco. Be good to animals, even people. See ya. Yo, it's Submit a true story or a creepypasta by ad- Fuck. <laughs>